And if we're going to follow him, included in that, he makes us fishers of men. But he uses our personality, our wiring, our gifting, our desires to do that. And there's somebody in your world, you're the only one they will listen to. There are many questions you are faced with every day. We are all searching for answers that will make a real difference in our lives. It's hard to imagine that these answers might be right in front of us. Get ready to discover answers in the Bible with Baylis Conley. I love this series that we're on right now. It's about the invitations of Jesus. They didn't just apply to the people of his day, they apply to us. They echo through every single generation. And one of the reasons I, I, I love this is because it's just so practical. It's something that you, you can get your hands around, something that you can actually do. So I want to encourage you, give your attention just for the next 30 minutes, and why don't you study the Word of God together with me today. We're actually talking about inviting people you know, into God's world, inviting people to embrace Jesus Christ and con to consider Him as Lord and Savior. And you know, God's wired us all up in different ways, and one of the ways He's wired us up is just, we love to tell our story. And that's where we're gonna begin today. So if you got a Bible, grab it, and let's get into the Word. Here's Bayless Conley with part two of his continuing message from last week. This third one that we're going to talk about, I'll call testimonial. Testimonial. And uh, you're familiar with the story. We won't go and read it, but I'll give you the reference. John chapter 9, it's the man that was born blind. Jesus healed him. Some of the religious leaders got mad because Jesus healed on the wrong day. Poor Jesus didn't know what day to do the work of God on. And they said to this guy, they called the guy that, that they all had known him. He was born blind. Now he sees. And they said, look, give glory to God. We know this man's a sinner. And this is what he said. Whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But what I do know, I was blind, but now I can see. Yeah. He didn't intellectualize. It wasn't confrontive. And they said, they said, no, you know, we, we know Moses came from God. This man, we don't know where he came from. And the guy said, well, this is an interesting thing. He says, we know that, you know, God hears those that worship him and that do his will. And if this man weren't from God, he couldn't do anything. And they said, oh, well, you were born in sins. And they cast him out of the church, excommunicated him. And I love what it says next. When Jesus heard that they'd kicked him out of the church, Jesus went and found him. And you may be here today listening to me, and you've been treated very cruelly by some people in a church. Jesus is coming to you. Amen. Jesus loves you. The testimonial. Didn't have an argument, he just had an experience. God probably uses me this way more than any other way to lead people to Christ. I always share my testimony, and I know some of you are so tired <laughs> of hearing my testimony. Listen, if you think you've heard it a lot, you need to, to have compassion on my family. <laughs> and the kids were small. Every time we drive by a cemetery, I'd slow down and say, kids, look out there. It's only the grace of God your dad's not out there. I was on drugs. You wouldn't even be born, kids. And they'd go, Dad, we know, we know. You were on drugs, and you asked God these questions, and you went to the, the mission, and they answered your questions. We know, we know. And I said, look, you're going to hear it again anyway. And I would tell them, some of you, you've got a story how you got saved, or maybe God put your marriage back together that was coming apart at the seams, or maybe you were healed. Somebody needs to hear that. God will use it. You think about it. The Apostle Paul, one of the greatest intellectuals of all time, wrote more than half the New Testament. At the end of his life, he's standing before kings, and what's he doing? He said, I was on the road to Damascus, 
and there was a light from heaven and Jesus appeared to me. He's telling his testimony before the rulers of the world. At the end of his life, he's still sharing his story. And some of you, maybe you need to write it down. Just, just think about it. Write some of the points down and think about how you can share it briefly in a non-preachy way to someone if God gives you the opportunity. Some of you, you've got a story to tell and you're overdue in telling your story to some of your coworkers. They would love to hear it and God will use it as a seed to help bring them in to the kingdom. <clears throat> All right. The next method of fishing for men is relational. Relational. It's in Mark chapter 5. Again, you're probably quite familiar with it. There was a demon-possessed man. He was so possessed, he didn't wear clothes. He lived among the tombs, cut himself with stones, and would cry out day and night. They tried to bind him with chains, and he would break the chains. Jesus set the man free. The man is so grateful. When Jesus is getting into the boat with his disciples, going back across the Sea of Galilee, he said, can I please come with you? Jesus said, no. Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he's had compassion on you. And he immediately went throughout Decapolis, a region of 10 cities, and began to tell his story. And the Bible says everyone did marvel. Now Jesus didn't say, go knock on the doors of strangers. He said, go tell your friends. Go tell your acquaintances. Go tell your family what great things the Lord has done for you. There is great power in just sharing with those that are close to you, those that you have relationship with. There's a great rippling effect that takes place. He went, and it says throughout the Decapolis, an area of 10 cities. It says everyone marveled. So apparently his friends told their friends, who told their friends, who told their friends. And there was just this great echoing out of the good news of Jesus. How many here, let me just ask today, you came to Christ directly or indirectly because a friend or a family member shared the gospel with you. Just look around. That's a lot of people in here. I would say the majority of people. Let's not undersell the power of just sharing. And you know, maybe you just have to live a godly life in front of them, live a changed life, pray for them, and then when the opportunity comes, you share with them. I think of some of the people on our team. We've got, you know, several guys that grew up in the same neighborhood. And one of them got saved at Cottonwood out of a gangster lifestyle, and then the dominoes started to fall. Their friends and acquaintances and family all ended up getting saved. In fact, let me share just a principle of how powerful I think this is. When God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, the cup of judgment was full and overflowing, and his mercy waited as long as, as he could. And he says, well, I'm going to go tell, tell Abraham the thing I'm going to do. He tells Abraham, and Abraham says, Lord, wouldn't you spare the city for 50? If there's 50 righteous people in the city, wouldn't you spare it? God said, okay, I'd spare it for 50. Abraham said, well, what, what if there's just 40 in the city? Would you spare it for 40? Sure. What about 30, God? Would you spare the whole city if there was 30 righteous people? God said, I'd spare it for 30. He said, well, don't get mad, God. Just, would you spare it for 20? I'll spare it for 20, and then finally, Abraham lands on 10 says, God, would you spare the whole city if there was 10 righteous people? God said, I'll save the whole city for 10 people. Why did Abraham stop at 10? Well, his nephew Lot lived in the city of Sodom. And there were 10 people in Lot's family. Abraham thought certainly Lot has reached his own family. But if you read the story, Lot had reached none of his own family. His married daughters and son-in-laws mocked him. His two daughters that were unmarried turned out to be quite immoral. His wife longed for the, the immoral life back in the city. And Lot alone, you know, he had a relationship with God, but he hadn't even won his own family. 
And just if he had reached his own family, a whole city would have been spared. And I wonder if we'll just get busy reaching our families, how might that translate out into the salvation of our cities? What might God do? Friend, there is power in relational evangelism. And then look with me back in the Gospel of John, John chapter 4. We come to the next method of fishing for men, and we'll call this one invitational. And we've already talked about it because that's what Philip did with Nathaniel. Come and see. Just come and see. Come check it out. Reiterating this invitation that Christ gives. And we find this well-known story here in John chapter 4 and verse 28. Jesus has talked to the woman at the well, verse 28. And the woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to them, Come and see. Come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. Drop down to verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of the city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, who told me, he told me all things I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him. And we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. She just said, come and see. She gave an invitation. You know, I've shared this story a number of times throughout the years, but I had a friend when I lived in Oregon. Her name was Rose. And Rose, she probably wasn't as old as I thought she was then. She was probably like my age. But I thought she was ancient at the time. I mean, I was like 21 or something, and I just thought she was ancient. And Rose was a Native American. She actually was from the Modoc tribe. She was a wonderful Christian, and she had a niece that was a wild girl. Her niece was an alcoholic, lived a very, very violent lifestyle, and had been in and out of hospital due to her alcoholism. She was living with a guy, he was an alcoholic as well, and um, she'd been back in hospital again. She'd pretty much destroyed her liver. And because of her drinking and some other associated things due to that, her stomach was just, it was filled with holes. She couldn't keep any food down. She'd try and eat a little bit of baby food and she would vomit that up. And she just got out of hospital and the doctors told her, you need to get your things in order. Says, you will be coming back shortly, but you won't be leaving by the front door. And... Her niece told her, said, Andy Rose, I started hearing these fluttering sounds by my ears. And Rose said, that's the angel of death. Now, whether it was or not, it scared her into coming to a meeting. <laughs> and there was an evangelist that I knew was having like a series of meetings in a little grain hall. It was in Klamath Falls, Oregon. And uh, Rose brought her niece out to the meeting. I'll never forget it. Shared a bit of the, the story. Took her up front. And the evangelist prayed for her. And there was maybe... 35 of us there is mostly empty. And he, he prayed for her. Nothing, you know, sensational happened. But he told her, he said, when service is done, I'm taking you out for a hamburger. She said, I, I can't eat any food. I'll, I'll die. I can't even keep baby food down. And he said, no, God told me to take you out. I'm getting you a greasy hamburger. <laughs> Jesus has healed you. So she went with him. You know, a few of them went to a restaurant afterwards, and she, he got her a hamburger. She tentatively took a little tiny bite and waited. No effect. Took another bite. She was fine. She ate the whole hamburger. In fact, I think she might have even eaten two. She was completely healed. Well, she went back. Here comes the good part. She went back to her family, told her boyfriend that she was living with, told her daughter what had happened to her, invited them to come out to the meeting, just said, come and see. Told her daddy, who was a famous rodeo rider, and her mom said, you have gotta come out and see. Just told her family, and I think she went to the tribal council, because everybody knew her story, everybody knew her, and said, look, you guys need to just come and see. The next night, I come to the meeting, and I came early, I always came early, 
And I just thought I'd get a seat up front like I always did. I always sat in the front, first or second row. There wasn't a seat anywhere in the house. It was packed wall to wall with Modocs. The whole building was filled with Indians, standing room only. This guy preaches, gives an invitation, and the entire, they, they move like this huge mass. They move forward. Her daddy got saved, her mama got saved, her boyfriend got saved, her daughter got saved. And it seemed like half of the tribe got saved. All of because of this, this invitation. God did something for her and she just said, look, come and check it out. And you know, you may not feel comfortable in, our, in, in articulating the gospel to someone. Just, just say, hey, look, come to church with me. I'll take you to lunch. You name the restaurant, we'll go there and just get ready. They're going to say something expensive. <laughs> but just give an invitation. And then there's one final method of fishing that I want to mention. And we're back in the book of Acts now, chapter 9. Acts chapter 9 and verse 36. It says, in jo at Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. Another Bible says she was always doing kind things for others and helping the poor. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. And since Lido was near Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. So Peter arose and went with them. And when he'd come, they brought him to the upper room. And all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. Now the, the story goes on, Peter raises this woman from the dead. But I want you to just notice that through her good deeds, through her acts of kindness, through making garments for the poor and for widows, she had impacted lives for God. This final method is just serving. Serve others. She used her gift of serving as a tangible expression of the gospel message. Through hospitality, through giving, through just being kind to someone, you can cause a heart to open to the gospel. Just serve someone. You know what? Even baking somebody some cookies can go a long way into softening a person's heart and helping bring them to Christ. Many, many people they already know what to do to become a Christian. The one thing they're lacking is someone to put the gospel in work clothes, to show them kindness, to soften their heart enough to respond to the message. All of us can do that. Just be kind. Think of something nice that you can do some, for someone and then do it in Jesus' name. And whatever the case, be faithful to share Jesus in your own style with the method God directs, whether it's confrontational, intellectual, testimonial, relational, invitational, or just serving. All of us fit in there somewhere. And all of us have been given not just the invitation to come and see, but to follow him. And if we're going to follow him, included in that, he makes us fishers of men. But he uses our personality, our wiring, our gifting, our desires to do that. And there's somebody in your world, you're the only one they will listen to if you'll just speak up. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment if you would. Lord, we so want to be obedient to your call. We want to be used by you. We want to be instruments in your hand that are effective. So we offer up our personalities, our giftings. And we ask you to use us with people that we work with, 
with family members, with friends, with the parents of the kids that our kids play with and do sports with, with the local grocer, with a neighbor down the street that always walks his dog by our house. Guide us, we pray. In Jesus' name, please, just for a moment, every head still bowed, every eye still closed. You know, I said earlier that I don't think you'd be here or you wouldn't be listening to me wherever you happen to be right now if you were not a seeker after truth. And the fact is, Jesus does say, come and see. But if you think about it, most every person that comes to Christ, there's a whole lot of conversations that have taken place, a whole lot of different fingerprints on their lives that have brought them to that place where they're ready to accept Christ. And it just may be that you've had some of those conversations, that you've considered some of those things and God has brought you to this point right now that you're ready to say yes to Jesus. You may not be interested in a bunch of rules and regulations or empty ritual, but you do want a relationship with God and the, the scripture is very clear that the whole world has sinned. The whole world stands guilty before God, every one of us. And there's no way that a righteous, holy God can come into relationship with us unless somehow that sin issue is dealt with and it has been dealt with once and forever on Calvary's tree. The sin of the world was laid on Jesus Christ, God's own son, as he hung upon the cross and Jesus was judged in our place. On the third day, God raised him from the dead and the Bible says if we believe it and confess him as Lord, that God brings us into this relationship that the Bible calls salvation. Being saved, saved from our sins, saved from an eternity without God, saved from having no peace in our hearts. He brings us into a life that has joy, that has an unexplainable peace, that has a purpose, that goes on into an eternity with God. And if you're here today, or listening to me and you've never opened your heart to Jesus, I wanna give you the opportunity to do it. I'm just gonna to count to three. And when I do, if you wanna get in on this prayer, I'm just gonna lead you in a simple prayer. I'm gonna ask you to lift a hand so I can see it. I'll acknowledge the hands, you can put them down, then we'll all pray a prayer together. You might say, well, why should I lift my hand at all? God sees my heart, true, he does. And true, you don't need to lift your hand. If you'll be sincere, God will meet you. But I think something as simple as lifting your hand can help your faith begin to move in the right direction because the Bible says faith is always expressed through corresponding actions. Just consider in an action that, that corresponds with your heart. Your heart is reaching up to God, your hand is doing the same. And I want to include those, the backsliders in here today, the prodigal sons and prodigal daughters. You know Jesus is real, but you are dangerously far from him today and you need to come home. The good news, God's not mad at you, but it's time for you to come home, prodigal. And I want to pray with you as well. One, two, this is your moment. Three, just put your hand up. Let me look around. Quite a few hands. It's awesome. All right, hands in every section. Go ahead and put your hands down. Everybody put a hand on your heart. Let's pray. Tie your heart around these words. Speak them to God. Say, dear God, thank you for your gift of salvation. I realize I cannot earn it, and I will not try. It's a gift that's received. I receive that gift now by saying yes to your son. Jesus, I believe you died for me, that you paid the price for all my sins, and that you were raised from the dead. And I ask you now, come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. It's in your name I pray. Amen. 
Stay tuned at the end of the program today for a special inspirational thought from Bayless. I don't know if you just prayed with us when I gave that invitation to our church. I hope that you did. And listen, if you have not yet opened your heart to the Savior, do it today. Don't delay. When we accept Christ, we come into a whole new relationship with God, and then we begin to grow spiritually. Then a journey with God begins. And one of the most important things in that journey is daily feeding upon the Word of God. We've got a, a way to just help you. It's really simple. You can go to our website, answersbc.org, and we have a daily email devotional for you. It's a bit of scripture and some thoughts about it, something that you can do quickly and then you can sort of chew on it, think about it throughout the day, maybe read some of the surrounding verses when you have time, but I would encourage you to do it, to get these daily email devotionals. You can sign up for it on our website. It'll help you grow, help you go from day to day, from strength to strength, from faith to faith. And listen, until next time, I pray that God's richest and best be yours always. And now here's Bayless with an inspirational thought you can apply today. In Matthew 6, 34, Jesus said, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own thing. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. It's as if God's put a 24-hour fuse in our heart. And uh, when you worry about tomorrow today, you're putting a 48-hour load on a 24-hour fuse. We used to have an air conditioning unit on one of our homes that it, there would be just a surge of too much electricity and the fuse was continually blowing. And I was always having to replace that fuse on that air conditioning unit. And the thing is, is when you worry about tomorrow today, you're putting that 48 hour lobe on the 24 hour fuse and something is going to blow. It'll erupt in your marriage. It'll erupt in broken health. Just one day at a time. God will take care of tomorrow. And some people are not just worrying about tomorrow, they're worrying about next week, next month. And uh, there's huge problems arising because of it. Listen, your Father cares for you. Cast your care on Him. And He will sustain you. You are loved by God. You know, we always go through different things in life. We always have besetting circumstances, the storms of life, come to everyone. But in the midst of those storms, there is hope. God always has an answer for us. He always has a pathway for us to walk. And I have a special bundle of of messages that will be a blessing to you. In whatever circumstance you're going through, they will bring you hope. I hope that you get it. God wants to get your hopes up, way up, or maybe the hopes of a loved one. Along with two hope-inspiring CD messages, this bundle includes a booklet with Bayless' amazing story of how God completely turned his life around, setting him free from years of addiction and confusion. Call or order online now. Just use the information on your screen. And be encouraged, there is always hope. Thank you for watching Answers with Bayless Conley.